Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for another informative panel as a part of our ongoing technical webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is titled Marine Biodiversity and Offshore Wind Infrastructure. Uh, my name is Ido Serla. I'm an eConcrete CEO, and I'm actually stepping in from uh, uh, Yaeli Rosenberg, our head of biology, who unfortunately is under the weather and lost her voice. Uh, a few housekeeping uh, uh, before items before we start. Um, everyone has entered the webinar on mute. This webinar is being uh, recorded and will be available afterward. Uh, the session today will be composed of three presentations, 10 minutes each, uh, and questions will be answered at the end of the session at the Q&A part. Um, as everyone is on mute, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A section below um, at any, any time during the webinar. Um, as mentioned today, we will be discussing the impact of offshore wind construction uh, on the marine environment and biodiversity in particular, and we'll address area of interest such as management of environmental risks, mitigation measures, monitoring, and regulatory challenges. Our panelists today, all top experts in their field, will be Remant Teohofstede from Van Oort, Christina Halden from Sea Tower, and Marina Beltri from Tecchio Ambiente. Uh, and I think with this, uh, without further ado, we will start with our first speaker, Remant Teohofstede. Remant is a marine biologist specializing in the effect of climate change and the human use of coastal marine ecosystem. He joined by Nord in 2014, where he brings science into practice by applying innovative nature-based solution for in the in infrastructural development. Thank you, Remant, for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ido. I presume you can share see my screen now. Not yet. Not. Okay. And now? Perfect. Okay. Go good. ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to uh, be a speaker in your, in your webinar. Uh, you asked me to uh, talk a little bit about changes uh, in the uh, offshore environment, uh, mainly due to the wind energy development. And uh, I will address that and also how a contractor for which I'm working for uh, is dealing with those uh, changes. Uh, a few words about my company. Uh, here. Uh, I, did, I work at Van Oort, uh, an international marine contractor with uh, head offices in the Netherlands and uh, satellite offices all over the world. We are active in dredging and reclamation, the construction of ports and waterways. Uh, we make infrastructure for the oil and gas industry. And of course, uh, we build a lot of uh, wind farms all over the world. Uh, we are family owned business. And that means that we really value um, the reputation of our, our uh, organization and a lot of our profit is reinvested in uh, into the into the company to uh, to develop measures that improve um, uh, 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 our works in uh, including uh, the, the the works that we do with respect to ecological enhancement of our works um what what we have been facing over the past decades is is that wherever we wherever we create an environmental impact uh, we always focused on limiting the negative effects. So trying to avoid any negative effects and also trying to reduce them. Uh, but since a couple of years, uh, we recognize uh, that we also should focus more on promoting positive effects. And that means like uh, including nature-based solutions into our designs, having more care uh, for the reinstatement of the ecosystems that we work in, uh, reuse the dredged sediment that we always have all around the world uh, for better purposes, uh, etc. cetera. And, and, and that is also visible in um, our works with respect to the offshore wind development. Um, well, if you go to the offshore environment, in general, it's like a vast empty sea, but I'm sure all of the people in the audience know it's not uh, really the case that it's empty. Uh, there's a lot of shipping uh, traffic, uh, fisheries are going on. Uh, of course, the extraction of oil and gas, uh, recreational activities, and since a couple of decades also, more and more uh, the development of offshore wind farms. So what does that mean? We see a change in the environment. And if we focus at the seabed, uh, uh, I'll give you an example of the North Sea, what happened over the past uh, 150 years. Like uh, 150 years ago, it was uh, still um, uh, occupied with a lot of uh, thriving benthic reefs, as in particular oyster reefs. Um, then uh, due to fisheries and the diseases, we ended up actually with a pretty sandy seabed 
uh, all of the reefs were destroyed uh, near to uh, extinction. And, and uh, what remained was a relatively deserted uh, empty seabed. Um, and now we see that with the development of all the wind farms uh, in the North Sea, we see opportunities for recovering these benthic communities. And why is that? Well, uh, that is because these wind farms, they have several benefits for the recovery of uh, benthic communities. And that is A, uh, often, at least in part of the wind farms, uh, fisheries, bottom, bottom disturbing, bottom trawling fisheries are not allowed. So the, uh, the, the, the seabed remains undisturbed for the lifetime of the wind farm. And also we bring in a lot of um, uh, hard substrate and in particular ar around the base of the foundation of the wind turbines, we uh, uh, deploy rock material to prevent the seabed from erosion around that base. And both situations, hard substrate and undeserved seabed, allow benthic communities to recover. Um, and how, how severe is this uh, what we do? Um, for, we have made calculations that at the end of 2020, we had already installed nearly 250 football fields of uh, rock material and uh, the areas occupied by, uh, by wind farms uh, were comparable to the size of about half a million uh, football fields. So you can imagine that the impact that, that the wind farms will have and the opportunities also that these wind farms will have is, is enormous. And especially if you think about the future, all the areas designated to become wind farms or at least uh, appointed to, to, to consider to become uh, uh, um, wind farms areas is it's, it's, it's far, far higher. So almost 5 million uh, uh, acres of uh, 5 million football fields will be, be, be become uh, occupied at the size rates at least of, by wind farms. Um, well, and this building of these wind farms, they both have risks and opportunities. And uh, many studies have been going on uh, about these risks and opportunities. The, the risk involves, uh, of course, the collision by the birds and uh, maybe changes in the stratification patterns with the effect on the, on the entire foot web uh, um, and um, uh, changes in the distribution of flatfish species, et cetera, et cetera. Many, many... Um, um, uh, concerns about are related for the environment uh, uh, are related to the wind farm uh, development, and there, but there are also many opportunities, and these are mostly uh, related to the increase in biodiversity. And um, uh, I would like to show you a bit uh, how the response was of uh, the, the 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 requirements set for developing um, uh, wind farms. Uh, in relation to the knowledge gained by all the risks and opportunities aligned with the development of wind farms. So it all started in the Netherlands, at least in uh, 2007, a few wind farms were built over time and they mainly addressed a low level of uh, nature um, aspects. And what was this low level of nature aspect? It was mainly related to protection uh, of, um, uh, of the environment. And we knew already in those days that the sound produced, for example, by piling the wind, found, wind turn, uh, turbine foundations into the ground is really loud and it causes uh, stress to the animals living in the sea. Uh, they change uh, migration patterns, but if it's too loud, even they could get physically harmed and even uh, they can cause death. So many of the uh, measures taken uh, along with wind farm development related to the protection of these animals. So trying to avoid um, the spread of this noise. So the contractors responded by developing all this type of measures. Uh, one was, for example, acoustic deterrent devices that could safely uh, deter animals by creating a safe sound uh, uh, at the source of the, of, of the work um, to, 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 for the animals to leave. They, they got scared by the sound uh, temporarily and, uh, and they were not harmed. But then once the animals had left the area where the construction would take place, uh, they won't, wouldn't be uh, 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 harmed anymore. So, and once the, 
the, the, the construction that finished, the animals could return to the area again. So that's a, a measure to deter fauna, so you can't um, affect them anymore in the area. And another measure was, of course, trying to avoid the spread of the sound produced by this uh, piling. So several noise mitigation measures were developed, so-called sleeves that entrap kind of the sound produced by the piling of the foundations, but also air bubble curtains. And the same, the same effect, you, you con constrain the loud noise uh, within the work area and it won't distribute throughout the environment. Well, next step uh, uh, in, in, in nature involvement of, of, of wind farm development uh, started actually uh, about five years ago with the construction of the uh, wind farms Borsela, uh, one, two, three, and four, and five, and also wind farms Hollandskust, uh, Zuid, and North. It was another level. And what was that level? It was that uh, any wind farm developer had to undertake demonstrable efforts to contribute to the strengthening of a healthy sea. Uh, so uh, the developers came up with the solutions. The first wind farm who would, had to incorporate these type of measures uh, in their development was the Borsele one and two wind farm. Uh, and what they did, they, they, they installed uh, concrete pipes actually, uh, type of sewage pipes from which uh, animal life could profit. They could shelter in it, they could uh, settle upon it, etc. And it was mainly focused on uh, stimulating and promoting uh, cod-like species. So the response of uh, the contractors on this new type of requirement was to further development, to further develop the, the nature enhancing measures that could be taken to promote beneficial, uh, to promote marine life in the wind farms. And one of uh, the measures taken is not only to focus on these type of uh, artificial reef structures, but try to change the design of the scour protection by, vary, by bringing in variation in materials like more uh, calcium rich rock material with, from which shellfish species profit. Uh, if you need to use concrete, try to use uh, eco-friendly concrete, uh, change the uh, vary in the, in, the, in the sizes of the rock material that you use to create cavities and shelter opportunities for all types of marine life, etc. And that's what we call landscaping. So trying to adjust the marine infrastructure to make it more beneficial to marine life. And once you have that life, you also want the life to be there. But often there is a connectivity problem. For example, uh, with uh, oyster larvae, the natural oyster reefs are too far away from the wind farms. So you have to bring in broodstock of these oyster larvae for the oysters to reproduce in the wind farm and initiate reef development upon your marine infrastructure. So those type of measures were then taken. And now, uh, since last year, actually, we are at, at a new level with uh, the tenders for Holland's Coast West and Amida Fair. Um, it's pretty advanced. And why is that? Uh, that is because they, uh, the Dutch government uh, implemented meat criteria, most economically advantageous standard criteria. And that means that you uh, can win the bid for a tender by coming up with measures to enhance uh, the ecological value of your wind farm. And you can score points on those measures. And if you don't score enough points, you just won't get uh, granted the wind farm. So uh, the developers, they, they, they went loose with all type of uh, measures that they could incorporate. Uh, protection was, of course, still the case. Nature enhancement was, still, of course, still the case, but also more and more attention came for monitoring the effect of all these the type of measures. Um, and, and that means that um, uh, a lot of, a lot of in, uh, new ideas popped up and were, were proposed in the, in the tenders. And also a lot of investments, uh, actual money, went into the development of ecological value of the wind farms. Whatever these developments are, uh, still a bit unknown uh, because these standards officially are not granted yet or are still in the process of being granted, but we know that they are, they are vast. And it's really a result of cooperation between the construction companies, the scientists, and the wind farm developers. Um, so to conclude, uh, uh, what now is we have this like this, this uncontrolled 
development of all these uh, type of measures with respect to protection and nature enhancement and monitoring. And it's kind of, it's going wild actually. There are so many options and so, so much is improved that our government is a bit lost. So what to choose when and where and how much and what is needed. So what we should aim for not from now on in, in the future is to come up with objectives for the seascape. Uh, so if you have clear objectives, you can focus your measures uh, uh, to reach those type of objectives. For example, if you want cod somewhere, you focus your measures on cod. If you want to protect uh, marine life, you focus your measures on protecting marine life. And um, it's, it's, it sounds easier as it is because before you can uh, uh, set these objectives, you should really know uh, uh, the area in which you are working and also the opportunities that arise from your construction works in, in the areas that you work. Um, and to support the, um, the government with uh, selecting measures, uh, me and my colleagues, we are currently in the process of, uh, of developing a systematic approach by which they can set these objectives. And it will uh, definitely, at least to, to our opinion, uh, lead to a, a more focused um, setting of requirements along for ecological uh, development along with development of wind farms. So I'll leave it to that. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Edil. Thank you, Raymond. Uh, uh, super informative and, and super interesting to see how the industry is now shifting between uh, uh, reducing environmental impact into creating uh, ecological uplift. And, and I think we see this trend uh, in, in different regions in the world. Um, I, I want to remind everyone that we have a Q&A session after the presentation, and you can add your question into the Q&A um, chat box uh, section below the screen. Um, our next presentation is going to be from uh, Katerina Haldin. Katerina is an environmental lawyer, environmental activist, and a former crew member of the Sea Shepherd. She's the head of business development and environmental protection at Sea Tower, where she joined five years ago to address the legal and regulatory challenges in marine construction. Katerina, floor is yours. Thank you. So, do you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. So, hi everyone, I'm Katerina. And I'm going to talk about the European offshore wind and its environmental protection. So uh, today's agenda uh, is what you see in front of you. Uh, I'm go not going to go into details in any of these um, topics. Instead, you're going to get an uh, overview of the topics. Um, what I want to tell you before we start, especially for those that are not um, familiar with uh, EU le legislation, uh, I'm going to talk about a few directives. And a directive is a legislative act that sets out goals that EU member states must achieve, but they can do it in whatever manner they, they want to do. So the starting point of this presentation is the rapid expansion of European offshore wind power, which is set to increase even more in the coming years. This follows changes and thus the increased renewable energy targets that we see in directives and plans uh, from the European Commission and also from the Parliament. And that is in order to meet EU's goals of reaching climate neutrality by 2050, and also a more recent goal to be independent of Russian energy uh, imports. Policies and legislations uh, must support offshore wind expansion while also protecting marine ecosystem and biodiversity. Repowering, the repowering EU plan from last year aims to deal with this, especially focusing on making permitting processes faster and easier for renewable energy infrastructures such as offshore wind projects. I also want to briefly mention uh, maritime spatial planning as an important aspect in supporting both offshore wind expansion and environmental protection. This is a tool 
that manages the use of the sea and the ocean from human activity, such as fishery, shipping, military, and obviously offshore wind. And all of these activities need to be done together in an eff eff efficient, safe, and sustainable way in order to guarantee the health of our oceans. So before moving on further, it's super important to mention the precautionary principle. This principle is the foundation of European environmental law. And the two uh, environmental requirements that we are going to look further at um, are both based on this principle. The precautionary principle should be the guiding policy when developing all offshore wind projects in Europe. The application of the principle means that where there is uncertainty about the risk of env environmental harm, the precautionary principle requires protective measures to be taken. And it's set out in Article 191, Section 2 of the Treaty on the Function of the EU with two other important environmental principles. And they are the principle of preventive action and the polluter pay principle. So with this in mind, let's look a little bit closer at environmental aspect of permitting processes establishing offshore wind farms. But first a few points. EU member states have different planning and permitting processes, but within these processes, measures are already implemented to ensure that member states follow their obligation to achieve and maintain good environment status for European seas. Furthermore, different laws applies depending on what maritime zone an offshore wind farm is located. So the first uh, of the two environmental requirements that all member states must consider during the permitting process is Natura 2000 area. These uh, Natura 2000 areas are a network in the EU with great na natural value. And they have to be especially con uh, a special consideration uh, in regards to this area during the site investigation phase of an offshore wind farm. And this is because these, area are, uh, these areas are established to protect certain species and their habitats that are uh, defined in the EU habitat and bird directives. Uh, and because of the great natural value, a special assessment assessing these species and their habitats must be done if an offshore wind power project is located within or nearby a Natura 2000 sites. The second environmental requirement all member states must do during the permitting process is also environmental impact assessment. And this is an instrument that sh shall be undertaken for all proposed activities likely to have a significant impact on the environment. The outcome of the assessment uh, are used to guide decision making. There is no requirement that the out outcome must be adhered to. It only requires decision to be influenced by the information. A further function of uh, the environmental impact assessment is to give transparency. It gives the public and those potentially affected by the project an opportunity to participate in the decision-making process through dialogue and comments. And I want you to note that EU has ratified the ESPO Convention and this means that all offshore wind projects in, uh, within the EU that are close to neighboring states, uh, these neighboring states must be notified and consulted in regards to expected si significant adverse environmental impact across uh, boundaries. So here are a few examples of possible, uh, possible environmental impacts that might be included in an environmental impact assessment. We are only going to look at one of these impacts, and that is an impact of ma major environmental concern, and that is the acoustic impact, which we simply call noise pollution. 
So noise pollution uh, during the construction phase uh, stems from um, hammering or pile driving in normal steel pipes, uh, most commonly for the, they are monopiles. Uh, and we drive them into the seabed, which cre create an intense cumulative noise and vibration that may pose severe threat to marine species. Uh, these impacts might be either direct or indirect. The direct impacts uh, can be, for example, temporary or permanent injuries such as hearing loss. And the direct impacts are impacts that create negative behavioral changes among species. For example, they stop feeding or they stop breathing. A major obstacle with dealing with these noise issues is that there is no universally established maximum decibel level of what is safe for marine, uh, marine animals. In addition to this problem, vulnerability to noise varies significant between different marine species. However, in, what's important to take along from this is that we need a shift of focus on what is safe. Currently, the focus is on noise that injures marine species. In order to truly protect whole population of species and thus our uh, biodiversity, we need to take a look at true safe noise levels. And that is noise that does not harass or behaviorally affect marine species negatively. So EU tries to take actions to better protect marine life from underwater noise. For example, a key part of EU's marine strategy framework directive is the monitoring and limiting of underwater noise. Member states are required to establish threshold values, ensuring that anthropogenic, that will say human-made noise, do not exceed levels affecting populations of marine animals. National thresholds for underwater noise, however, vary from member state to member state. Some member states don't even have legal threshold. But one of the most, I think, famous thresholds is the one from Germany. It's the ones that has existed for a very long time. And it's the German sound protection concept. And this is a concept to protect the harbor purposes from sound exposure during construction in the German North Sea. And it's a dual noise emission threshold of 160 decibel sound uh, exposure level and 190 decibel uh, uh, peak, uh, uh, to peak sound pressure level at a distance of 750 meters from the piling source. So in order uh, to, um, to meet these noise thresholds and in order to limit uh, the, the noise uh, pollution, we have to look at the foundations that are used in the offshore wind industry. And normally what we, uh, what we divide these foundation is between bottom fixed foundation and floating foundation. I would like to divide them differently. I would like to divide them in piled Noise, noisy or loud foundation and quiet foundations. And if we look at the piled foundation, monopass and jackets, those that are more noisy during construction, uh, we have a, a technical noise abatement system that can reduce this noise pollution, which otherwise could rise over 200 decibels. And individually, these various techniques may reduce the sound exposure level around 10 to 20 decibel, but in combination with each other, they can re a reduction can be more than 20 decibel. So here are also the quiet foundation. We have floating, we have suction buckets that can both go on jackets and uh, monopiles, and then we have the gravity-based foundations. The company I currently work for is a technology company that designs um, uh, float and sink gravity-based foundations. So these quiet foundations, uh, they don't really uh, uh, submit uh, sound emission uh, uh, from their installation process since they, there is no deep penetration into the seabed. 
So last but not least, I have a proposition for you all to think about after this uh, seminar. And that is with the knowledge about the precautionary principle and about the knowledge that you have about the fact that there is no established maximum decibel level of what is safe for marine life. It is not more advantageous to avoid adverse impacts than try to minimize or mitigate them. And I want you to all remember that environmental protection is not just about ticking a box in the permitting process. It's about saving our oceans and the, their inhabitants while developing a sustainable and blue energy production. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Katerina. <clears throat> that was uh, very educating. I, I, I must say that the uh, discussion that we're gonna see and, I, and we're seeing also popping up on the question is how you define your targets. Uh, uh, what 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 is how do you balance between uh, uh, the anthropogenic requirements and and the development of those offshore assets, <clears throat> and 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 the impact that they have on the environment? And I think it's 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 coming from different levels, from the settler community that was described before, and and also for the for the water column as well. So I want to thank you for this. Um, and our last speaker today will be uh, Marina Beltri. Marina is a marine biologist specializing in uh, biodiversity and marine conservation and management. She joined the Tecchio Ambiente a year ago as a senior consultant, where she lead and manage environmental project. And you're welcome to take the stage. Thank you very much, Ido, for the introduction. Um, let me go ahead. I'm still seeing, um, Katarina, your screen. Let me see if I can just... Grab it. There we go, <laughs> yeah. Can you confirm that you can see my screen? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, so yeah, thank you again for the introduction. I'm happy to be here and talk about Tecno Ambiente's work uh, related to offshore wind farms and their interaction with biodiversity. So in this presentation, we will briefly see some initial considerations. So we will be a little bit setting the context. Um, I feel like Raymond and Katerina maybe already did, but um, I'm hoping to give a little bit more detail. And then we will move on to see what the main environmental impacts are associated with the, with the offshore wind farms and how we're monitoring them um, at Tecno Ambiente. And also finally, um, we will see management of the risks and some prevention and mitigation measures when considering biodiversity. So some initial considerations again, um, it's important to note that no two offshore wind projects are the same. Um, different structures, for example, have different effects. Um, we can see in this image, for example, now again, we see uh, fixed foundations. You've seen this with Katarina. Um, in the case of fixed foundations, we're looking at um, the most common type of offshore wind farms um, at the moment. And those are typically located in shallow waters. They're um, near the coast and they use steel or concrete foundations that are anchored to the seabed. And then on the right of the image, you see uh, the newer type of offshore wind farms, and hopefully uh, towards where we're moving in the future, which are designed to be deployed in deeper waters. Um, they're further offshore, and uh, they use platforms that are anchored in place using mooring lines. And again, each of this uh, type, these platform types has different environmental impacts. Another point to take into, into consideration when analyzing the impact of wind infrastructure um, uh, is the different stages of the life cycle of, of an offshore wind farm. So regardless of the type of wind farm, uh, we will see three main stages. We have construction, we have operation, and we have decommissioning. And within, sorry, and within each of these stages, uh, there will be actions that will cause a disruption in the environment, uh, which will result in environmental impacts that um, we will be seeing shortly. Uh, for example, construction phase, uh, typically, requires large number of vessels, uh, including supply ships, uh, barges, installation vessels. Um, also, prior to the installation of the turbines, the seabed must be prepared to ensure a stable foundation. And this can involve um, dredging, removal of sediments. Um, there's also cable laying, which can require trenching. Um, during operation phase, we have actions related to the normal functioning of the, of the wind farm but also activities to maintain and service these farms. And finally, at the end of their 
operational life, which is uh, nowadays uh, more than 20 years, uh, offshore wind farms need to be decommissioned. And during decommissioning, we will see many actions that are similar to those during the construction phase. So the question is, how do all these actions uh, translate into environmental impacts? So we move on to see uh, main environmental impacts associated with um, the offshore wind farms, and also we'll see their monitoring. Here we have summarized um, six of the main impacts that result from um, offshore wind farm projects. Of course, each of these impacts will be more or less severe, depending on the life cycle phase that we're at within the project, depending on the project itself, uh, depending on location. So there's many variables that will affect the severity of each of these impacts. Um, the first one is noise pollution, as uh, both Raymond and Katarina already mentioned. Um, it is one of the uh, most important ones, and it affects marine species, particularly those that rely on sound for communication, um, for navigation, for foraging. Um, so effects of noise pollution could be uh, behavioral changes, such as avoiding noisy areas, um, altering their migration patterns, um, and this can have long-term effect on their fitness and, and survival. They might have problems um, finding mates, so it can have an, an influence on their um, reproductive rates, and it can even lead to physical injury. So like um, Raymond also said, it could even lead to death, um, especially during very loud or sudden noise events, such as those um, generated by pile driving during construction. Um, then we have uh, changes to water quality. In this case, we're talking about the release of sediment during the construction phase, um, for example, that can lead to increased turbidity and reduced light penetration in the water column. This can have negative effects on seagrass beds, for example, and other benthic habitats, but um, also on the distribution and abundance of uh, plankton and other primary producers. Um, another factor to take into account here um, in water quality is the potential release of pollutants, such as oils, lubricants, and other chemicals that might leach into, into the water, um, uh, the same way that maybe uh, anti-fouling or anti-corrosive paints um, could do, and that could have uh, direct toxic effects on marine organisms. Um, thirdly, we have the electromagnetic field effects that are derived from power cables. Um, these uh, EMFs are generated by the electrical currents that flow through the power cables, and uh, they can disrupt the behavior and physiology of a certain species. For example, some studies have found that EMF can interfere with the ability of fish to navigate, um, to find food, and to communicate with each other. Um, but uh, it is also important to note that the strength and extent of the EMF field uh, decreases rapidly as distance from the cable increases. So that means that the impact on marine life is typically uh, just limited to a very small area around the cables. Um, then we have uh, changes to atmospheric and ocean dynamics due to energy removal and modifications derived from the actual presence of the infrastructure. We're talking here, for example, of the wake effect, which can induce changes um, in water flow and alter sediment transport and nutrient cycling. And finally, um, we have point five and six, which is habitat alteration and structural impediments, which I believe are quite linked um, because the construction and operation of offshore wind farms involves the placement of large structures on the seabed. So we're talking the, the turbine foundations, the cables. So this, can, um, this means a, a direct physical disturbance and displacement of benthic organisms the loss uh, or modification of important habitats such as rocky reefs, um, sandbanks, and seagrass. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also the prospect of the reef effect, something that um, Raymond was talking about. No? So any structure that is placed in the marine environment um, has the potential to be colonized by organisms, so as well as generating habitats on the, on the artificial reefs, they can also enhance the abundance and diversity in the surrounding area. Um, in fact, not only this, but during our ROV surveys, we've seen that around offshore man-made infrastructure, um, we can find the most undisturbed ecosystems. And that is because other anthropogenic activities um, cannot take place, like for example, fishing and specifically trawling. Um, regarding structural impediments, offshore wind turbines and other infrastructures can act as physical barriers. 
In fact, we can see in this image here on the right, um, we see the flight path of waterfowls. These are birds, <laughs> they are the black lines, and the red dots are the wind turbines. And we can see how the birds alter their course to avoid flying through the wind farm. There are still some kamikaze birds that fly through the farm, but mostly they tend to avoid it. And in fact, species such as loons, um, cormorants, and certain species of diving ducks are found to regularly detour around wind farms, which will impact their flight times and eventually their overall fitness and <clears throat> energy resources. Um, in that sense, there's also the issue around collisions, but the overall frequency is generally considered low. And although it is possible that uh, the presence of offshore wind turbines can increase the risk, of course, um, more studies are needed. So the question is, how do we monitor all these impacts? So uh, first of all, the most important thing is that uh, the monitoring of the effects revolves around the environmental monitoring plan. Um, this plan is typically developed as part of the environmental impact assessment or any similar process. And it is intended to ensure that any potential adverse effects of the project are identified and addressed in a timely manner. Uh, the EMP typically includes a description of the environmental factors that will be monitored, um, like water quality, noise levels, um, wildlife populations, but it also includes a description of the methods, so the monitoring methods and tools that will be used, as well as the frequency and duration of the monitoring activities. Um, some examples here of what how we can um, conduct this monitoring for different environmental variables. Um, for noise monitoring, so for noise pollution monitoring, um, we, we place hydrophones. So those are basically underwater microphones um, in the water. We place them near the wind farm to ensure the sound levels and frequencies generated by the turbines, vessel traffic, and, and any other sources of noise are recorded. We can also use passive acoustic monitoring. Um, this is another method and it involves using underwater autonomous recorders that can be left in place for an extended period of time. And this approach can help identify patterns and trends in noise levels. I'm just going to quickly skip over this slide um, to show you an example of some noise monitoring results. So in here we can see um, this model on the left how noise level decreases with distance to the wind turbines and how we can find the highest level of noise right at the turbine. So um, it is very localized. And then uh, the graphs on the right, uh, we can see the different sound level pressures depending on distance, wind speed or turbine size. And again, um, this graph uh, helps us see um, how the design of the wind turbine. So in this case, they're all uh, fixed foundation they're concrete, monopile, jacket, and tripod. Um, so we can see how the design can affect the sound pressure level as well. So back to the, to the monitoring slide. Um, other monitoring techniques include, for example, the senses of pelagic fauna and seabirds, for example, using binoculars from land, um, on board, also through aerial surveys, uh, GPS tagging of birds. Um, very important to have an MMO on board as well. Seabed visual surveys, um, sorry, seabed, <laughs> seabed visual surveys, uh, which can be done uh, by divers or ROV, depending on water depth, location, and also safety considerations. We have water quality measurements. Um, in this case, we can see our team using a rosette system that is made of several Niskin bottles and uh, that is made to collect water at different predefined depths. And of course, there's many other techniques and methods to collect data. Um, all related and all tailor-made to the environmental variable of interest. So now we've seen uh, some of the main environmental impacts and now we will see some of the management strategies um, to ensure a minimization and avoidance if possible of these impacts during the whole life cycle of the wind farm. So the first step or even the step zero in all projects is the design of the project, of course. And it is crucial that within the design project, we take into consideration all environmental aspects related to the project. And that is why we perform complete environmental studies and surveys, which will eventually feed into the EMP. Modeling must take place, not only at engineering level, but also um, of environmental variables, such as uh, EMFs, uh, noise, hydrodynamics, 
And uh, finally, it is crucial that site selection takes into account a full maritime spatial planning study. Here on the right, we can see an example of all the factors that go into consideration when doing a site selection process. Um, for instance, uh, we have wind resource, but also protected areas, um, Natura 2000 site, sensitive habitats, migration patterns, and other uses of the marine space. And here are some uh, proposed prevention and mitigation measures that can be taken um, to ensure that the habitats, uh, that the impacts are minimized during all phases of the life cycle. So to name a few, we have uh, use of low emissions uh, maritime means, use of maritime means that have low acoustic emission certificate, that uh, silent E, this is a notation that ensures ships um, do not exceed average to moderate underwater radiation noise levels. And we have compliance with uh, MARPOL regulations, but also any other um, local or regional regulations that are in place. Um, availability of measures to combat accidental contamination, such as oil spills, monitoring of uh, the horizontal drilling and cable laying process via geomorphological surveys, um, sediment blowout containment measures at the ATP exit, and of course, continuous environmental monitoring. Um, just a few more here. We also have uh, limiting vessel speed uh, to a maximum of 10 knots. Um, some noise reduction measures that um, we've seen already in this webinar. This is a picture of um, some bubble curtains that work by uh, changing the density of the water. And that's why they break um, the sound waves. Also other um, possible um, reduction measures would be the use of quieter uh, turbine engines as well as planning activities to avoid sensitive times and locations, which is also um, quite crucial. And then we have collision avoidance systems, um, technologies such as radar or acoustic monitoring. Um, they both can be used to detect the presence of birds and allowing for early warning and avoidance measures. Um, and in one word, we said that, and um, the use of techniques such as the jetting or the plouching for cable laying to ensure the minimal affection on the seabed and the use of cable coatings or materials that can reduce um, the electromagnetic field emissions. Overall, um, I would say that the key is monitoring and adaptive management and that regular monitoring of the impact of offshore wind farms can help identify potential issues and inform adaptive management strategy. It is uh, just, to conclude, it's important to note that there is ongoing research into the most effective strategies for mitigating the impact of offshore wind farms and that the optimal approach may vary, again, depending on the specific project and the species uh, and the environment present in the area. And that's all from me. Thank you. Perfect, thank you, Marina. <clears throat> Actually, we, we're getting quite a lot of questions, which is, which is really great. Um, and, and thank you for emphasizing the importance of, of monitoring. I think I think this is a, a crucial uh, uh, part of, of everything that was described today and, and gaining the data that you can take your decision according to the to a, a objective targeted uh, uh, monitoring that will provide you the, the, the data that you want. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank all our speakers uh, for your insights and perspectives. And, I'm, and, and I can see it triggered a lot of interest. Uh, and, and I think we can we can jump for the Q&A and, and maybe begin with a, a first question that came up for uh, Marina. Um, what are the challenges of monitoring offshore wind farms? Uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, just the nature of, of, the, of the fact that the wind farms are offshore, that's already a big challenge in itself. Um, that entails a lot of logistics, mostly. Um, so access offshore wind farms are often located in remote or challenging areas, which can make it difficult and expensive to access the site and conduct uh, all the monitoring activities. And uh, weather conditions is another one because of the, again, of the offshore nature of the site, uh, we can expect high winds, uh, high waves, and that can make it difficult not only um, to you know, get to the place, but also to collect accurate and reliable data. So we don't want the data to be influenced by you know, a certain, um, certain weather event. Um, and then we have uh, the whole data analysis, which will be uh, you know, in regards to collecting large amounts of data. Um, that can be complex. It may require uh, specialized expertise, 
uh, resources. Uh, we need to interpret the data effectively. And we need to do it for um, in the long term. So uh, we're looking at projects that uh, maybe construction can take from uh, months to years. Operational phases uh, span over decades. And um, there's also the decommissioning. So it is very important that we always um, we, we do careful planning, uh, management, as well as you know, communication and collaboration between um, stakeholders at all times. Perfect. I think before you, we, we step to, we, we jump to another question. And another question that I think is, is you can answer very, and it's coming from your presentation, was how do you monitor the local ecological effect of electromagnetic fields separately from habitat alterations? Yes. So, well, for, to monitor um, electromagnetic fields, there's um, specialized equipment to do it. So there's the um, what also called magnetometers. Um, it is important to know that before any um, any construction is done or any uh, wind farm project is placed, we will do um, pre-construction assessment. So we will be do, we'll be doing a baseline study of all the environmental variables. And then once construction starts, we will have type data to compare it with. So we will go, for example, in the case of um, power cables, we will go with the uh, magnetometer and we will measure the fields around the cables and compare it with the values that we had prior to the construction. Um, that's also a patchy approach. So um, before and after comparison and also being able to have a control site is also very important. Um, in terms of habitat alteration, I think that was the other part um, of the question. Um, that's a little bit different. So um, we see that EMFs are very localized within the power cable. So um, they might span a few meters, but not more um, habitats. Uh, they, they are usually larger and we see these um, via all the surveys that we can do with divers and with ROVs. And, and with uh, and, and a question from me is, is uh, electromagnetic fields are, are, there's a threshold that you're, 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 you're working according to. So how do you decide that it's, it's too much? Or exceeding is, something. <laughs> that all, that's also a very good question. And there's also um, a lack of uh, maybe standardization across uh, across countries. And even there's uh, some member states that have none. Um, it is the case here in Spain. So um, in general, electromagnetic fields, um, they're not that high. I mean, we're talking very low uh, emissions. It's not one of the most, uh, I'd say, the the most important effects, they're, they're really very low. Um, we still don't have a threshold that we should you know, keep an eye out for, but still um, we, 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 would be, we wouldn't be seeing that much of an increase, no. Perfect, thank you. Um, and with this, I'll jump to Remit because I think it's, 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 it's heading your way. And, and, and it was a discrete, uh, you described the objectives that you're working on on, on uh, nature enhancement. Um, can you describe what are the objectives that you need or give a little bit on what are the objectives you need to address in order to get the uh, uh, ocean wind farms uh, um, nature enhancement to be successful? Yeah, well, mainly I think it's that you, you, you really uh, set the requirements that are most suitable for a certain area within your seascape. So it's pointless to, 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 to develop a, a, a reefs in a very dynamic uh, area, for example. Um, so so it, 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 should, it should match. And also it's very important that there's a joint effort being put in it. So to, to avoid any bias towards developers or towards ecologists or towards policy, all, all disciplines, they should join forces in, in, in setting objectives to, to, to determine whether whatever you develop is feasible. And, and mainly also most importantly might be even um, to, to always pursue upscaling. So if you develop a measure, keep always in mind or that, that, that whatever you develop and, and invent should be scalable. So it, you could, for example, install a golden uh, artificial reef, which is maybe very suitable for oyster larvae settlement, but of course that's not scalable. And what we have already noticed, well, shellfish bivalves, they prefer shell material, uh, but shell material, the supply of shell material is not uh, unlimited. So you can, you can never uh, create an area large enough to, to, to host all those uh, uh, bivalve larvae with shell material. So you, seek, you need to seek for other solutions. Perfect, thank you. And, and, uh, and maybe jumping to another question on that, uh, on, on that topic, 
there was a question asking about uh, you described the uh, um, oyster larvae uh, introduction. Uh, are those are uh, native or non-native species? Yeah, they are native. They used to be there in this history. So uh, we are aiming for the same species, definitely. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Katarina, next question is it came up to you. Do you think the uh, current abatement system can sufficiently protect marine life from noise emission from uh, pile driving? <clears throat> well, I think it's difficult to say yes on that one. Um, and the reason why I say that is I think it's easier to say that uh, uh, noise mitigation methods uh, can go down to levels where it stops direct injury. I think that's, that's most probably more possible. I think where the issue comes is when we are talking about um, behavioral changes that are negative. I saw some question about the North Atlantic right whale um, over in the US. We are talking about so many studies that are showing now that they are stopped calling, they are stopped uh, ceasing um, to feed around noise levels uh, that are around 140 decibel. And I think that is an issue with noise abatement methods that we really don't know this level when uh, when the behavior starts to, uh, when it becomes a negative behavior. And negative behavior, we might not see it today or tomorrow, but in five years, in 10 years, if they stop, stop feeding, if they stop breeding, then we will see the big impact, impact on the population in five, 10, 15 years to go. Um, uh, when it comes to um, uh, these direct injuries, we see it immediately and it comes big headlines and you know, people get engaged, but these gradual changes, which you know make it more difficult and more difficult and more difficult they can sometimes go unnoticed so therefore my answer to that i'm very very unsure about that i'm very unsure about that and there's another question came up on the, on the same subject is is that we see now an increase in size of piles and in size of turbines and are the mitigation measures are are are, are faith that can face that this change or are now designed to face the new, cha new challenges? Well, um, what's happening at the moment is, and I, I saw some, some question in the chat about that, that yes, these noise uh, mitigation measures can be used in conjunction with each other, and therefore they become more uh, efficient. But the question is, uh, and this is a question for everyone involved in the offshore wind, in, wind industry to actually ask ourselves that is part of this, are they sufficient? We don't know. That's the answer. We do not know. And then the question is, are we going to gamble? Will we gamble? Are we gamble? Yeah. Uh, uh, th thank you. Thank you for this. Uh, there, there is a, the, um, um, a, a related question. I think it's an open question. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, directed to, uh, it was directed to all, all, all speakers. So, so uh, there, there was a lot of discussion about uh, and, and noise was mentioned in, in all of the uh, presentation, but uh, can you share what is your uh, European experience has been with changes to nutrient delivery, productive and impacts on bottom uh, of the food web, at the bottom of the food web. So, so basically uh, the, we, we, we all deal with, I guess, um, social communities and noise and pelagic and, and others. But um, is there also a monitoring that is related to uh, um, large scale processes that is happening within the water column? Marina, you want to start with this? Yes, yeah, <laughs> I guess I'll start. I mean, um, when we plan, you know, in environmental monitoring plans, it, it does seem like we're almost even separating each variable when we are um, monitoring it. So for example, we would be looking at plankton or we would be looking at water quality. But then let's say the beauty of it is that um, in the end, when you process the data and you put everything together, um, that's when you're looking and you're trying to make connections and you're trying to look at the bigger picture. So we're not only you know, trying to look at each variable all on its own, but rather we're looking at the bigger picture and we're always trying to find links and, and looking at the overall ecosystem as a whole and not just you know, a single variable at a time. Thank you. Robert, you want to add on this? 
Yeah, sure. It's it's also a process in development. I think uh, in, in the early years uh, we cared a lot about the mammals being harmed by the noise, etc. But uh, we are becoming more and more uh, especially aware of the potential impacts on other uh, parts of the marine ecosystem, and 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 especially uh, now that the huge rollout of uh, wind farms is ongoing, uh, all the cumulative effects they they start uh, uh, being of becoming of concern. So I, I, I don't think we have the answer yet, but uh, I, I do know that like the monitoring Marina is talking about is important to validate all the models being developed to be able to calculate the impact of these uh, vast amount of wind farms going to be developed. So it's in process. Thank you. Karina, you have uh, something to add or I can jump to uh, uh, another question because I have a lot. No, you can jump, you can jump. I just Perfect. want to say that I think it's great from uh, an environmental lawyer's point of view that all of us from the different field has actually snapped up on what's happening uh, uh, on the European level. And that is the concern over noise pollution that exists in our oceans uh, today. So that, uh, that I find really, really positive. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, there's another question that I think is can should be addressed by by everyone, and, and how and the question is how do you balance the need for renewable energy with the potential ecological impact? So so how do we balance this? How do we balance the need and and of ecology and environment from both sides? Um, I'll go first <laughs> if it's fine. I think uh, just very shortly, um, just like what Katrina was saying before, um, it requires a multi-phased approach. So uh, close communication and collaboration between all stakeholders. So uh, from wind farm developers, uh, environmental regulators, but also other stakeholders. Um, so that they can all be included in this careful planning and management in a way that we can create all these effective mitigation measures and uh, you know, ongoing monitoring assessment um, to make sure that, that the offshore wind farms eventually uh, are implemented in a most uh, sustainable and responsible way. I think, I, think I, I can add on this, that there's two questions that are popping all the time. And there are a philosophical questions that, need, that is hard to tackle with. The, the first one is exactly this one, is, is how do we balance the environmental impact of, of renewable energy on, on a global and how we compare reduction in CO2 and all the association impa associated impact on, on, on the land with, with what, what is the impact on, on, on the local habitat. And the second one that that I that I was figure I I thought going to pop up during the discussion is is the it's this it's basically the habitat change we're, we're dealing with area which are silty and sandy um, of course they're they're usually associated with a low biodiversity but we're changing them to hard substrate so so uh, um, I, I think Raymond touched it in 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 his in his discussion on biodiversity that that we need to find those currencies. That will allow us to 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 evaluate performance of, of completely different habitats and 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 level them. Um, biodiversity, for example, is, is is one of them. So there's like there's there's major question. I I must say I'm still struggling with them, uh, and I think a lot of the, the other people are, are struggling with, with this as well. Uh, but it's it, it's something that it's it's not going to be answered, in on my opinion, uh, um, in the near future. And I jumped in. Uh, I'm I'm I'm, I'm uh, anything to add. Marina and, and Oremi. No, I, I agree with everything that Marina said. I think it's spot on. And I would also like to add that uh, the best available techniques and methods uh, by using them, uh, I think that adds uh, an extra uh, touch to what Marina said. You know, very much look into what's the best available techniques. Uh, what techniques do the less harm? Um, can, can we get this to work also from an economical uh, standpoint? Um, so that's what I would like to add to. Uh, Maria. Yeah, and, and that is how communication also plays a crucial role. So it's very open that um, you know all projects also communicate with, with each other and they're transparent and there's um, a little bit of shared data so we can all implement all the R and D and you know newest developments and newest uh, techniques and technologies into our projects and not keep repeating the same mistakes. Hmm. Perfect. Anything to add? 
yeah, well, maybe to this letter that a, a lot of the knowledge is still under the radar because of the commercial value of it. And it will only uh, pop up once uh, a certain project team has been granted the wind farm and other project teams that have not been granted the wind farm still have very good ideas that they don't share uh, broadly. And, and that's a loss. So it, I think it's better to, in advance of, 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 of the development and the, the, the uh, setting the criteria for the development, these, these scientists, they should join forces bef in setting these requirements. And then you, the, the authorities can uh, pick the best requirements for a certain wind farm, instead of that all the developers that need to, to, to perform the bid are dividing their uh, uh, forces. Perfect, thank you. And what I'm doing now is I'm coupling, I think, five different questions that came during uh, 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 now during the session. And, and, I, and I'm gonna address it the same way. Um, and it's about how do you monitor the effect above the water, uh, both of on, on, on aviation, on, on, on sound, et cetera. Um, can you share your experience of, of environmental effects that are can be measured and seen above the water? Um, well, uh, prior to um, any construction of, of uh, wind farm project, there's also the modeling part. And I feel like um, things above water tend to be more like aerodynamics and, and emissions and all of this, uh, there's very good models and very good um, data sets and a lot of information that can be used. Uh, so you can already you know, foresee what the effects um, will be thanks to those models. Um, but then during, uh, during construction and during operation, there's, uh, there's equipment, uh, for example, to measure air emissions from the vessels, from the construction. Um, there's uh, equipment that measures the currents. So you might uh, want to validate your models, for example, and seeing this wake effect, for example, of, uh, of the wind turbine. So there are methods uh, prior and also during um, uh, an offshore wind farm project um, that can help you measure all of these and, and validate. So they are in place and hopefully, you know, will advance into more uh, technologically advanced techniques, but uh, they are in place. Yeah. But, but you, you mentioned different types of, of monitoring of methodologies. Uh, are, within those monitoring schemes is monitoring above water effects. On, on birds, on, I don't know, on, on, on migration of, of, of birds, on, on other. Is this something that is addressed during the monitoring phase? Yes, for sure. So we're, of course, not only looking at underwater effects, we're also looking at um, mostly seabirds. So they are one of the biggest concerns aside from the noise because of um, the whole migratory patterns and the, the physical barriers. And even if it's small, also the collision risk. So there's, um, that's why it's also important to have, aside from the census, there's a big effort in um, GPS tagging species. And uh, there's a lot of projects that already have in place um, avoidance collision measures. They have um, lights, they have sounds uh, to make sure that those birds don't come near the project. Perfect. Anything to add before we uh, close because we're heading towards our uh, end of time? So, so with this, I would like to uh, uh, thank all the participants and also our, our speakers and, and maybe to close with, uh, with, with the take home message from today is that we, we, we see and we saw that they have governmental policies and developers, researchers um, are, are aiming to reduce the ecological impact of offshore construction. And, and I think what is, what is unique that this is, this is a multidimensional topic that need to be addressed in different levels and to address in an interdisciplinary approach. We will include the engineers and including the scientists and, and include the biologists and regulators and the academia. And, and, I, and I think it's a starting point that the industry is shifting. Uh, and we see that uh, um, on, in, in, as a term, as basically a, a line in all presentation. And, and, uh, and we will continue to, uh, um, as a group that dealing with the impact on environmental, I think, I think in different levels, we're gonna see um, different approaches and, and different methodologies coming into practice in the coming years, just because of the booming in the industry that will, be, that will drive the, the financial uh, uh, support and also the interest to find a new way for uh, ecological uplift and uh, reducing ecological impact, local ecological impact. And, uh, um, and, and I think the last thing is the importance of collecting data. It's, it's all about making sure that we're collecting data in a proper way and we utilize it and we share it uh, 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 across disciplines. 
And uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank everyone. Uh, uh, the recording of this session will be shared with all the uh, registered participants in, in, in this webinar, as well as uh, uh, we got a lot of questions. So we will try our best to answer and then and add them as we share the link uh, of, of the presentation of the session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for attending.